in order to make successful AI agents, you have to connect these data sources. And some things that execs can definitely empathize with is the frustration that they're sitting on piles and piles of information, but they're not able to pull it together in a reasonable way. I'm Sam Denton. I'm the head of the enterprise ML team here at Scale. Um, today, I'm joined by my colleagues, Felix and Clemens. Felix, want to do a quick intro? Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, I'm Felix. I'm currently the head of engineering for our enterprise team at Scale. Clemens? Yeah, and I'm Clemens. I lead product here for the Scale AI platform on the enterprise team at Scale. Awesome. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about some of the technical challenges and consideration for building enterprise agents. To start, Clemens, can you talk, start by walking us through how Scale sets up agents for enterprises? Yeah, definitely, Pedro. So I think like when we think about like building agents for enterprises to solve any kind of um, custom problem for, for enterprises, um, we roughly think about like three uh, core elements of which we have built our approach and also our product around. The first one is capturing the business logic that we um, for the problem that we're trying to solve in the agent. Um, then there's like a data flywheel component. So we're trying to build agents that actually get better as they're being used more. And then the third is uh, we need a systematic way to actually measuring how good these agents are in order to like make sure they're, they're ready for prime time. So talking about each of these individually, like a little bit more to give an example. So capturing the business logic, uh, we've built um, an agent orchestration framework here at scale and an agent execution environment that enables us to capture arbitrary business logic into kind of like, um, like the agent workflow. So to be concrete, like say you're trying to um, build an agent that generates a complex clinical research document for a life science use case, these documents are typically involved, typically involve data sources from many different areas of the business. There's like very um, sophisticated logic that goes into producing some of the statistical test results. There's additional uh, data that needs to be captured maybe from uh, the internet or other data sources. So there's a lot of logic that goes into very long documents and you can't just like prompt uh, a language model to produce all of this in a one shot uh, because these are just like way too long and way too involved. So like we've built essentially an agent orchestration framework that enables us to capture all of that intricate logic into like a workflow um, that can be like nested and have multiple um, different levels. And then that also like dynamically integrates with all kinds of data sources and tools in order to essentially like capture that logic. The second part is like the data flywheel component. So like we are strong believers at scale in that agents can only really perform well if they're actually trained on the feedback that uh, humans give while using them. We wanna have an agent that produces an initial draft of a document and then use the approval or like the edits that experts make to this initial draft output as the training data to make the agent better. This we um, often call um, this process of like capturing um, expert feedback in order to like build training and evaluation data for agents is what we like refer to like as the agent monitoring protocol. So like it's a key thing that we've built into the platform, like instrumentation to trace and, um, all of the executions of the agents and then have human feedback associated with these executions and have that data be the centerpiece of like making it better. I refer to it also briefly as a flywheel because the beautiful part of it is um, the more the agents are being used, the more of that feedback and the direction data we're producing and hence kind of like the better we can like make the agents and that by uh, def like by definition will almost all, the, almost all of the time lead to um, us being able to like, then also like improve uh, the agent, which then leads to more adoption. Um, and the third part is like systematic way of like measuring quality. So of course you can like improve the agent using the data, but you need a good way outside of gut feeding to actually like um, assess is the agent actually improving? So is it actually like able to um, capture, like cover all of the critical um, quality bars that our uh, business logic requires, for example, for generating these complex documents? So that's why um, our product, uh, the Schedule and Platform SGP, also has extensive ex instrumentation to run evaluation, uh, meaning kind of like ability to uh, very dynamically set up evaluation test sets. Um, and evaluation criteria, and then can like dynamically on the platform, like run evaluations, either using humans in the loop 
or kind of like fully automated using LLMs as a judge. Um, and that enables us to like measure not just like whether the system is up to quality bar, but also whether it's improving over time. So these are really like the three elements to recap briefly, like capturing business logic, um, then uh, kind of like having this data flywheel of having the agents get better with feedback and then measuring uh, quality in a, in a systematic way. Awesome. Um, now that we've sort of set the stage and concept, Felix, do you want to talk about some of the challenges that you face in actually doing this? And, and for me, you know, a lot of my, my, my daily work goes into making the system secure, right? One of the most important parts about this agent um, framework is that it needs to connect to enterprise data in order for it to be useful, right? I mean, you, you, you know, we're not building like toy applications here where we can connect to some folder and, and, and have it work for your, your personal use, right? We're talking about a large enterprise with a lot of access controls. Uh, you have to deal with compliance, you have to deal with security, right? And so these are very complex situations, right? So one of the most important things that we offer is the ability to deploy into customer tenants. We deploy as single tenants, uh, for isolated data resources, and we also have multi-tenant options, right? This level of flexibility allows us to have um, different levels, varying levels of speed and security for customers. Uh, and over the past couple of years, we filled out basically thousands of uh, vendor security questionnaires dealing with compliance and legal concerns and all that sort of stuff um, in order to make sure that our system and our platform um, basically keeps all this enterprise data secure while bringing AI to these, to, to, to these customers. Um, and in terms of why, you know, all of this work is, is really important and really nuanced, there's data in all different sorts of places. And in order to make successful AI agents, you have to connect these data sources. And some things that, you know, exec, execs can definitely empathize with is that is the, is the frustration that they have, they're sitting on piles and piles of information, but they're not able to pull it together in a reasonable way. And that's where scale comes in, right? And scale... Uh, you know, as a baseline, as a foundation, we offer this security, this sense of security and this, this you know, these best practices. Um, and then we have engineers go into the systems, um, work with the engineers, work with the security teams, and do the hard work of pulling all this data together so that Sam's team um, can actually build the AI on top of it. I wanted to pause for a second and ask you about how you guys handle sort of permissioning on the back end side for all of these data sources, right? She talks about how you have data in all of these different places and you want to make sure it's all secure. But I think one of the things that, you know, all enterprises we see are struggling with is all of these data sources have different permissions, right? Yeah, no, great question. And, and, and Clemens, I'll hand it off to you to talk a little bit about the, the platform in a second. But for us, um, the way we do it is we, we natively ship with an identity service. Um, which basically does all these access controls for us, right? So every single user basically is a certain persona. That persona has a certain set of permissions granted to them um, by admin controls, right? And so admins have the ability to kind of assign different permission boundaries to different groups of users and also segment each of these users into different groups, which we call accounts, right? And so what we guarantee is data isolation between these accounts and across data bound uh, permission boundaries, right? And so you kind of have the flexibility as a platform user to control these different segmentations. So if I wanted to build, you know, a, a HR AI agent, for example, I can put that in a separate account. I can have different users with different permission boundaries as different levels within that account to restrict kind of what levels of access they, different levels of access they have in within that AI agent. And that entire system will be completely isolated from a separate account, maybe for, I don't know, customer support. Um, and these two things don't want to see each other at all, don't even want to know about each other's existence, right? And so um, that's something that's really, really important to enterprises and, and something that, that ships natively in the, in the platform. Maybe, Clement, do you want to talk a little bit about um, how this works? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I think it's a super important point that's often, like, talked much less about because of, these are, like, the less glamorous parts of, like, um, enterprise-grade platforms. So, I mean, like I talk a lot about agent orchestration, having data flywheel, having evaluation, but a very big part of like, I think why enterprises um, love to work with us is that like, we have a lot of like the heavy lifting done to kind of like 
just like deploy these agents or as full end-to-end -end applications with the agents behind them um, in enterprise grade environments. And one of the big elements is like, correctly to say, Sam, is kind of like having proper identity and access management. So we have like a homegrown identity service that essentially manages all of these tasks that like Felix just alluded to, including like really having the ability to um, permit, per, um, grant access per permissions to kind of like each individual resource um, that is managed throughout like the scale platform. Yeah, and, and just to kind of quickly touch on some things like, I mean, actively we have a ton of customers that use this feature, right? So one of the largest banks um, uh, in the world basically has, you know, is building hundreds of Gen AI applications, right? That's their charter. Um, in order to do that, they have to have proper segmentation, right? I mean, you think of a financial firm, um, you think about security, you think about data privacy, you think about different teams working on different things. Um, you know, and so it's really, really important to them that we get this right and that they have the ability and the flexibility to manage it on their side, right? Because so, they have compliance and rules that they have to follow. Yeah. And, and on the topic of things that sort of, quote unquote, just work, uh, what I wanted to talk about is sort of as LLMs and Gen AI has transitioned over the last sort of year and a half and the next year and a half, uh, one of the things that's really challenging about making things that work in the enterprise setting is that when you change these designs of how you use these LLMs and Gen AI applications, you're also changing the data behind the scenes. Um, and working with this evolving data is actually really challenging. Um, and you know, I'll talk a little bit about some of the experiences we have we've had in that. So if we take like a year and a half ago, I mean, everything was really focused on RAG, right? And um, you know, a year and a half ago, we found that if you told an LLM that it could do RAG or could not do RAG, it was up to the LLM you'd find more times than not, it was making the wrong decision, right? And so you were actually forcing the LLM to do RAG every single time. Now I think we're at the point where we're, we're able to leave the decision up to the LLM to get to sort of like this enterprise quality decision, but we're constantly thinking about sort of the future of agents and where agents are gonna go, where you have an LLM that has access to hundreds and hundreds of tools and is choosing between these hundreds of tools. But the reality is, is that this isn't there at the enterprise level yet that, that we need, right? If you think about every decision being 95% accurate, if you make 10 decisions, then you're only gonna be like 60% accurate or something like that, right? Um, and so along the way, we kind of have to give ourselves a little bit of a skeleton or a little bit of structure of working with these agents to make sure that decisions are uh, easy enough decisions that we're making enterprise grade sort of solutions and enterprise grade accuracy and quality. Um, so if we think about this big transition from sort of like RAG being a hard decision to agents that have hundreds and hundreds of tools, along the way, we want to be capturing data the whole way, right? And we want to make sure that that data, as these agents evolve, is still useful for future agents, right? Um, and I think that's one of the things that, that we've really started to focus on in terms of how we fit into sort of building agents into the scale Gen AI platform is by making sure that the data that we're capturing and whatever structure we're using, whether it's sort of a rigid system where LMs are only making one or two decisions at a time, or whether it's this future where you have an LLM with you know, 10 plus tools and deciding how to call these tools in what order, um, that we're capturing the right data along the way and that we're using sort of structures and traces that we can learn from no matter what state of building and agents that we're in. Yeah. I think this is a really great point. Like one thing I would love to um, dive a little bit deeper there, Sam, is kind of like when you talk about like all of these hundreds of decisions that these models, uh, mostly reasoning models now need to make, I have like so many tools and like we, we don't really know like which tool is it going to, going, to, going to use. How does that translate into what we talked about earlier with regards to the Asian monitoring protocol and how we think about tracing? How, how do these decisions uh, make it into that? Like how are they reflected? Yeah, so... Uh, when we talk about sort of like the the capturing of these decisions, right? Um, there's a lot of different protocols. You'll hear things like MCP. You'll hear things like chat completion, tool calling, tool completions. And I think the key is that we standardize these things as best we can, such that we can access this data in a standardized way for the future, right? Um, and this will allow us to essentially take these decisions and gather information about how many tools were called. Is this the expectation of how many tools we should be calling? How were these tools called? Was there actually like an issue with the way that this tool was called? Did we have to retry calling this tool? Um, did the response of the tool make sense? Did the LLM use the response of the tool well? Um, so sort of standardizing the way that tools are called and the way that tool responses are sort of fed back into the LLM around sort of a single 
execution framework is how we actually make the, the monitoring and traces actually useful for the future, right? Is standardizing sort of how we think about tool calls. Sam, I did want to ask one question about something I think is very important for people, which is what is the difference, you know, between building an exam, like, you know, something comes out, I'm going to try it, right? I'm going to try it. I'm going to, and I'm going to be I'm wowed by it. It's going to like MCP comes out. I'm going to like connect it to my Slack. It's going to be really cool. And I'm going to build an agent. What's the difference between that and an enterprise grade kind of agent? Um, how do you feel as an ML engineer, kind of like how you evolved and, and what do you think about those two things, like toy problems and enterprise problems? What's the biggest difference? Yeah. So I think uh, the toy problems are kind of really great starting points of how we want to think about the vision of these enterprise problems, right? Um, the way I think to, to sort of bridge that gap is really around two things. One is uh, leveraging sort of enterprises to help us drive home what is the goal, what are the expected outcomes, and sort of giving us this feedback that we can then use to essentially maybe simulate these tools in an environment to find the correct reasoning traces that actually get us to the solution that we're looking for, right? And once you sort of create this environment where you can understand the enterprise problem, you can let these reasoning agents sort of explore the right path to get there on their own, right? Uh, and then you can sort of pull out the traces that actually got there, right? And pull out the traces that are aligned with sort of what the expectation is. And then all of a sudden you have enough examples, as you said, of these traces and these reasoning paths that got you to the right end state that you can then learn from them, right? And you can train models on them and then you can sort of see different uh, parts of your system uh, with few shot examples or maybe retrieve sort of certain things that might be helpful. All right, well, I think that's all for today's discussion uh, about some of the sort of more technical things that enterprises should keep in mind as they work on building out these agents. Uh, it's truly a really hard problem and I think it's okay to sort of accept that, embrace it and sort of work through it. Um, next week, you'll you'll get into how we'll get into how we use agents to capture the institutional knowledge trapped in enterprise subject matter expert heads. Uh, this is where agents get really truly powerful, and that's why it's worth sort of navigating all the challenges that we laid out today. Uh, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss it.